This is Sam Boy Terry from Greet Death, and you are listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The New Scene. I am your host, Keith, and we're back with a brand new episode. And on the show today, we've got Ryan Parrish of City of Caterpillar. City of Caterpillar is back. They've got a new album out on Relapse Records, Mystic Sisters. We talk about that. We talk about the early days of the band. We talk about the new days of the band. And do you realize, and I don't know if everybody realizes this, but Ryan has been in every band ever. Darkest Hour, Bleach Everything, Mammoth Grinder, Iron Reagan. He's done it all, he's seen it all, and we cover it all. That's coming up momentarily, so strap in. It's a great conversation. And now I have a special announcement to make. You've heard me asking for a long time for Apple Podcasts and Spotify reviews. The goal was to get over 100 reviews, and I have to tell you something. We've done it. We've done it. We are over 100 reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. We did it. And I have to thank you, our listeners, for your support in getting us there. You know, I started this podcast from the ground up, from nothing. And your support, you getting us over 100 reviews on both platforms, it shows that we can accomplish anything. If we put our minds to it, you know, I don't have a big pre-existing audience. I started this thing from the ground up from one listener to where we are now. I'm out here grinding for every single play, every follow, every like, and every download. And I want to thank you, our listeners, for getting us to this milestone and for your continued support. And I want to thank Iodine Recordings for their continued support. I can't do it without all of you. So thank you. Thank you so much. And now I want to read some reviews. 420 Nug. Five stars. Great pod. Title says what I mean. That's simple and to the point. I like it. Thank you, 420 Nug. Joe M. 1982. Road to 100 likes. Five stars. Love hearing these interviews. Wishing you and your guests the best. Favorite episode? Cold Cave American Nightmare. Thank you, Joe. That's one of my favorites as well. Ms. Ross 66 says, Great podcast. Five stars. Great guests. Casual approach. Very enjoyable. Always look forward to new episodes. Thank you, Ms. Ross 66. James 8712 says, Great podcast. Five stars. New to the new scene. It'll take me a while to catch up, but I've started the journey. These interviews are outstanding. Perfect for a soon-to-be 40-year-old scene kid. Thank you, James. Sean from Chicago, five stars, grade A stuff. Super down-to-earth and insightful podcast. Always entertaining and has introduced me to tons of amazing music. Keith, you're a great host. Keep it up. Thank you all so much. I'm over the moon right now. I didn't think we were ever going to break the 100 five-star review milestone, but we've done it. We have done it, and we are there. And you know what? My favorite compliment is when people tell me that I'm turning them on to new and awesome music that they dig, because, look, I've I've taken a lot of crap for my musical taste over the years. When I was younger, people say, "Why? what is this screaming, rah, rah, kill your mother, kill your father, members of my own family, oh, no, don't put on the music, oh, everything you listen to sounds the same, it's not good. People I've dated, oh, we hate your music. Don't put it on. Listen, I'm not saying everybody. I'm not saying everybody, but it's great validation and makes me feel awesome that I can curate these collections of music and conversations and bring them to you and that people are enjoying it. It's the best feeling in the world. And really, I can't say thank you enough. I've said it many times already. So one more time, thank you for your continued support of the new scene and also support Iodine Recordings. Check them out on Instagram at iodinerecordings or their website, iodinerecords.com. 
And speaking of new music, I've got a great recommendation for you. Holy Fawn is back with a new LP. It has just come out. It's called Dimensional Bleed. I've listened to this thing multiple times. They've done it again. They've done it again. This is their first new LP since 2018, and it's great. It is great. My favorite track is True Loss. It's life-changingly good, I'm telling you, and it makes me want to cry every time I hear it. I have a lot of personal feelings attached to this band. I still remember discovering them via a Arctic Drones Best of Post Rock list. I think it was their end of 2018 list. And if you haven't checked out Arctic Drones, do that. They used to post these big lists of the best albums, best post-rock and post-rock adjacent albums of the year. And I would check it out every year. And they're on Instagram at the same handle now, Arctic Drones. They curate these amazing collections of post-rock and post-rock adjacent music. You know, you've got cinematic post-rock and metallic post-rock and just they do it all. They've got incredible taste. Check them out. I credit them with turning me on to Holy Fawn. Holy Fawn is a band that can do no wrong in my mind. Great music, great aesthetics, great merch. They've got it all. And I'm going to put True Loss on our new scene Spotify 2022 playlist. You can hear the track there. Go check out the band too. You cannot go wrong there. So listen, check back in with me in segment three. I'll talk about how I'm doing. We'll catch up. But right now, we are going to speak to Ryan Parrish of City of Caterpillar. Enjoy. All right. We are here now with Ryan Parrish. Ryan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Keith. Yes, it's absolutely great to have you here. You know, you've got a lot going on. We have City of Caterpillar is starting back up. We've got a new album coming out this month, Mystic Sisters. We have gigs. You have a storied history and music beyond that. And Ryan, we're going to cover all of that. But first, let me ask you, how are you doing today? Today, I'd say pretty damn good. It's been a hot one. But uh, we got some rain. Felt pretty good about that. The dog and I went for a nice walk. He's feeling good. You know, it's been a good day. I got to say. I like that. I like that. Yeah. You know what? It rained all day yesterday. Like, well, I should say all evening, late afternoon to evening, nonstop rain. And I really liked that because I I felt like I didn't have to do anything. So I just took it easy. Gives you a lot of reasons not to do much. I mean, the motivation when it's raining, there's not much there. No. I mean, what are you going to do? You can't go walk around in the rain. This isn't like a movie where people just stand outside and have a full conversation in the rain. That doesn't happen. Yeah. No one's splashing in puddles and having laughs. That's just not happened. That never happened. <laughs> I'll never see it. It's never happened. <laughs> well, Ryan, it's good to have you here. And uh, you know what? I want to get to know you a little bit first. So we were talking a little bit before the show and you said you're living in Richmond now. Did you grow up there as well? I did. I actually grew up uh, about 15, 20 minutes outside of Richmond. Chesterfield County is where I'm. It's where I lived my whole life. Been here my whole life. You must like it if you've been there your whole life. Well, <laughs> well, I think I've just I've been fortunate enough to travel quite extensively throughout my life, so I've never really had any reason to leave. And there's nowhere I've been that I've said, you know, I could live here. That just hasn't happened. Yeah, you know what? That's a good point. I I have talked to several musicians, and they'll live in a smaller town. And then I'll think like, oh, why? And it's like, because they see every city every year. Like, they're not missing anything. You guys get to see it all. Yeah, I get a good dose of it too. You know, instead of having to live through the troubles and the hardships of certain cities and certain places, I just get to experience it for 24, 48 hours, depending on what we're doing. And then I'm right back out again. So for me, it's, uh, I've gotten accustomed to living here. I kind of know the ins and outs and I just take it in stride, feel pretty good about it. I like that. I like that. So what do you got? You got a family? You got uh, pets? What are you working with there? I'm working with a dog named Red. He's one of my, uh, not one, he is my best friend. And I've got uh, two chickens, one named Laverne, one named Soju. They live out in the backyard. I got a cat named Eddie. She's a killer. She brings home dead animals for us all the time. I <laughs> got myself an incredible woman. Her name is Kim. She's my rock. And uh, together we just sit around the house when we can and enjoy each other's company. It's real nice. That does sound really nice. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's it's beautiful, actually. I'm very happy. I'm very content. 
What is it like owning chickens? Do they recognize you? Are they friendly? Yeah, they actually are. Uh, Kim is a is a chicken whisperer. She can just go in there and they go right to her. They love her. They can get on her shoulder. They relax. With me, the little more a little more timid. They take their time, but eventually they come around. And uh, they're they're still kind of young. They're about eight weeks or nine weeks old. So we got them when when they were very small. But they like to hang out. They're not laying eggs quite yet. But um, they've been a lot of fun. Actually, it's fun to be watching them grow and all the crazy stuff they do and how they'll eat anything. It's very exciting to see. I love that. So you have chickens. It sounds pretty rural. Are you doing any like self-sustaining lifestyle and growing food or any of that kind of stuff? Yeah, we we got a garden. I mean, we're not, you know, we're not Farmer Brown over here, but we got, we got some stuff going. We got some squash some cucumbers, tomatoes, some peppers, you know, I don't know, just some stuff that you can kind of get behind. Nothing too crazy, but, uh, you know, she makes a great salad and I can, uh, I can do pretty good, good work on the grill to give me the right stuff to cook on it. So <laughs> all just depends. But uh, yeah, we, we, we get by all right. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So let's talk about your history with music. Have you always been interested? Is it something you picked up later? Honestly, uh, music has been just part of it since as far back as I can remember. I used to I used to make tapes of NPR and listen to classical music. And then once I heard the heavier stuff, I used to go to the pool and there was this older group of kids who used to listen to ACDC, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest. And that stuff used to just shake my shake my very foundation. I loved it. I loved it. So just started to get more into that. And then around 11, 12, I went and saw Metallica. They became my favorite band. And I saw them for Just For All. And uh, my dad took me. And my I went with my friend Jeff, who ended up, he hated it. But, <laughs> but I really loved it. <laughs> it changed my life. So I just, and ever since, I've just been, I've just been listening to metal, playing in metal, doing as much as I can in the metal world. And then, you know, of course, as Life goes on. You hear more music. You meet friends. You they've got different music musical tastes, and I just started to explore through everything. And I got to honestly tell you that I love everything. Every style of music, there is something that I can enjoy. I don't like every band and every style of music, but there's also I feel like there's a band in every genre that I can honestly say changed and helped shape and form my musical taste to this day. I love that. Yeah. So it sounds like metal was the entry point. Did you land anywhere in particular? Like me, I was into really metallic hardcore for a while. I was really into post rock for a while. I have different phases. Is there is there something that really grabbed you where you settled or were you just kind of listening and involved with everything? I would say I got into debt, like after Metallica and Iron Maiden, I just wanted heavier and I just went deeper and deeper into the wormhole of death metal. And that's where I, th- I still to this day love death metal. That's the one music that has stuck with me through it all. I, I love it. I, I just love it. And Carcass is one of my favorite bands. So that gave me like the noisier grind aspect of the death metal scene. And I love all that stuff too, but anything really chaotic, really, really, insensitive <laughs> kind of uh, <laughs> kind of dark and depraved uh just brutalic artwork like i guess one of my newer i wouldn't say new now but maybe newer death metal bands i'm getting into or have been into for the past few years is piss grave i love that band and i i don't know i just i just love death metal that's that is the one genre that has stuck with me i'm with you too man i've done some post-rock stuff had some waves and that and some of that stuff has has you know kind of fizzled away and some of it stands true to this day but with death metal it never went away. It's always just there inside my heart at all times. I love that. I love the name Pissgrave too. That's really good. Check them out. They are absurdly disgusting. They'll, <laughs> they'll blind you with death. It's sick. Yeah. You know, before I knew about hardcore or like any subgenres or anything like that, the the mainstream death metal stuff you would kind of see sometimes. And it was really scary and intriguing. Like there was this guy who lived a couple houses down who would wear cannibal corpse shirts and it, it just seemed like the scariest but coolest thing ever yeah the scarier the better i think that's what i mean i used to go to sam goody and just look at covers of records and if and if i didn't even know what it was but if the cover looked disgustingly crazy and i knew my parents would hate it i would get it and i would have <laughs> it and i did that for a long time i mean i was wearing cannibal corpse bush of burst t-shirts to school but i had to put it in my backpack first and then change when i got to school because my mom saw that she'd go crazy. And there was actually one time where she did see it on the, on the back of that shirt is a fetus skeleton on the back in the fetal position. And my mom saw that and she's like, butchered at birth, what the hell is that? And I told her it was anti-abortion and she loved it. There was no more question. I was like, this is an anti-abortion statement. She's like, oh, okay. I mean, it's not, of course, but 
whatever let me keep keep, keep the t-shirt you know I, I would i would say that's pretty brilliant and quick thinking I yeah say. look on my toes and i got to keep that shirt for a long time because on the front of that shirt two zombies butchering a woman with a ton of dead babies in the background on meat hooks so i mean it is a sinister t-shirt i remember that album cover actually it is, they they have some pretty gnarly ones that's one of my favorite cannibal course records to this day that record stands the test of time would you get in trouble for wearing those shirts at school though uh, I don't think anyone even knew what was happening. <laughs> like, it was, there was no, that wasn't really happening then, you know, they didn't really, I mean, no, no one ever told me to take it off. I mean, I used to, my friends were wearing carcass t-shirts. No one ever, carcass is my favorite death metal band of all time, but no one ever told us to take any of that stuff off. Oddly enough. Oh, uh, if there were like, you know, uh, genitals or, or stuff like that, they would probably be upset about, I think guar shirts weren't very cool because they had some phallic representations on there. Yeah, I'm th- I'm just thinking of like I w- did 12 years of Catholic school so anything remotely uh what's the word I'm looking for salacious uh, you would you'd have to take it off. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think oddly enough I think some of the some of that death metal stuff I don't know just no one caught on to it or like maybe they just weren't paying attention. I really don't know. Never got in trouble though. Well, that's good. So when did you get started playing drums? Uh, I started when I was 12. Are you self-taught or yeah, tell us about it. So I was getting sent home from school all the time because I was just banging on my chest and banging all over stuff on the tables. And I really didn't even know. I, I mean, I, I knew I liked music and I was just playing along with the music that I liked, but I never really realized that an instrument was on board. That was the next, ne- you know, that was what was happening. And my dad brought home a used, like a yard sale drum set, just this piece of crap. And I just played, played it to death. So uh, I think that was when I realized that maybe drums were it. And I just stuck, stuck with it. Never stopped. Yeah, especially if you're getting sent home from school for banging on things. I mean, why not make it useful and put a drum kit in front of you? Yeah, that's exactly what my dad thought, and it worked. <laughs> so how long until you started performing live and in bands? Uh, so immediately, I'd say, I'd say another year went by, and then I started meeting some people. Uh, Corey Smoot was the first person I ever started a band with, my friend Chris Barron and Corey Smoot. And we had a band, like a metal band. We were covering Slayer. We had a couple. We had a couple originals. We played "Seasons in the Abyss" that song at our talent show in seventh grade. And uh, I, because in sixth grade, uh, we were just kind of starting to understand what our instruments were all about. And then we were comfortable enough to start playing. We played a birthday party actually in sixth grade. <laughs> that was my very first <laughs> show. It was a it was a birthday party. And when the girl walked in, we started playing Four Horsemen" by Metallica. But we did we did we did Megadeth covers too. And then uh, we started getting, you know, like I said, it just started to spiral to deeper and darker things from Metallica, Megadeth, Exodus. And then we just started going Slayer, Cannibal Corpse. <laughs> it took a Napalm Death, Death, the band Death. I don't know. We just started going, like I said, anything with a cover that looked completely insane had to have it. Yeah, I imagine within a couple of years, you guys must have been really good, too, because if you're using those bands as your basis to learn instruments, you, you must be able to shred pretty quick. Yeah, we I, I, honestly, I was very fortunate to be playing with the guitar players as I was at the time. Chris Barron was, is still to this day an incredible guitar player, classically trained. He went on to be classically trained, but he was already very, very good. And uh, and then Corey, Corey went on to be in Guar for a long time, so he had a whole... He had a whole thing with him too. He was also just very talented, really creative musician. So I was fortunate to get started with those guys. And then later on, uh, I started another band after that, after uh, Corey started a different band. And I started a band with Chris Norris and Chris Barron and this guy, Jason Mintz, Tommy Lithgow. And we started a band called uh, Disinterment. But before that, it was called Gutted. (laughs) We were called (laughs) Gutted first. But then there was another Gutted in the death metal world. So we had to change our name. So we changed it to Masochist, and then we like, that game, that name kind of sucks. So then we changed it to Disinterment. Disinterment is good. Yeah, and it was three guitar players. It was very melodic death metal because uh, Chris Norris uh, was way into the European-style death metal. So he brought in the Inflames, Star Tranquility, that sort of vibe to our lives. And, uh, you know, because we were all just death metal heads, and he came back from – he went to Germany on a student exchange program and came back with all this incredible death uh, melodic death metal. And that just completely changed the trajectory of what we were doing. It was still death metal, still fast, still crazy, still growling. But we had a lot more uh, like harmony, melody elements, more musical elements, I'd say, uh, that started to to build. And he was a huge part of that because we went on to be in Darkest Hour together. 
And that's where most of that stuff came from. Chris wrote majority of that music. And it was, you know, if you ever heard Darkest Hour, then you've heard some melodic death metal at its finest, in my opinion, even though we've got called metalcore all the time. I never understood that. <laughs> but I don't know. Such is life, I guess. Yeah. I Well, I guess there was a lot of melodic metal, hardcore crossover stuff. So, you know, but I, I yeah, I always thought Darkest Hour was definitely more metal. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I mean, we loved At The Gates, but everyone else used to always say that we were just At The Gates ripoff. And I, we never thought that. We, we never, it didn't even, it didn't even occur to us that we were anywhere near that because I didn't think we sounded like At The Gates at all. They were way less melodic. I mean, they were great. Don't get me wrong. Love that band. It took them telling us that, that we didn't sound like them to make us feel like that. You know what? You're right. <laughs> we don't sound like you. That's great. <laughs> so they actually told you that? Yeah, they did. They, uh, in 2004, we went to Sweden to record a record. Uh, and we had Thomas Lindbergh do some backing vocals on a song. And he told us that none of this stuff sounded like At The Gates. And that, that made us feel great. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's direct from the source, everybody. Right. It's yeah. from, from Thomas himself. That's right. He told us so. And it did make you it did make you feel good, right? I, I maybe I would have felt weird about it in a way too. No, because we told him that everybody says we sound like at the gates, and he goes, Why? You don't at all. And we met him with uh he came to town with the crown. We did a US tour with the crown one time and it was incredible. So we just made instant friends and got to go over there and hang out in Sweden. Very cool stuff. Just you know, I don't know, just great relationships made over the years for sure. That's awesome. How did you decide on Sweden to record the record and and did the label fund that for you? I guess because of you just had so much real metallic influence. Yeah, and Studio Fredman was where all that stuff was recorded. Dark Tranquility, In Flames, uh, Dimension Zero, all that stuff was recorded there. So we were like, why not go to where it all happens? So we just begged the label to help us out with it. They did, and we flew over there. I mean, we had to pitch in as well, but it, it, it at that point, it was like whatever it takes to make this happen. And we, and we did, man, it was a, it was kind of a brutal trip because we were there for a month. It was in the dead of winter, snow everywhere. And we stayed at a, a friend, a, actually his even crazier story, this amazing person named Ellen let us stay in her apartment, which is a one, one bedroom studio apartment thing. And she, we all just slept on the floor like sardines. And we had to walk to the studio every day in the snow. This is like an old person telling you how they, how they got to school. But we walked, through the, <laughs> we walked to, through the snow for like a mile. We snuck on trains. We snuck on buses with all of our gear <laughs> to go there every day. And we did that for a month. That's like the most metal way to record a metal album, too. <laughs> Possibly. Yeah, like you're crammed in a studio apartment. You're at the mecca of the metal universe where all the greats have recorded. It's dark. It's cold. It's snowing. And you have to sneak your way over there. Yeah, that's that's what happened. It was pretty metal, I guess. No, I <laughs> so how was it recording in that studio? I mean, just it sounds like everybody has recorded there. It's just, you know, just walking around, looking at the collection of, of the records that have been done there. And then the special appearances of people just coming in and out of there. I don't know. It was definitely like being in an amusement park for me melodic death metal and Swedish style metal. I mean, we were we were just blown away. Jaws on the floor the whole time. It was an incredible experience. That's awesome. Were you happy with the album? Yeah, it's called Hidden Hands of a Sadist Nation. And I got to say, it's probably one of our heaviest records that we did to date. About the At The Gates thing, I think with At The Gates, I think they were just one of the biggest crossover metal bands. You know what I mean? Like someone that everybody knew, because I didn't listen to a ton of metal. I listened to like some In Flames, some Nightingales, but at the gates, that one record, everybody listened to that. Yeah, I think that was also, yeah, I mean, that transcended genre. That definitely went into the hardcore community. I mean, hardcore kids knew who at the gates was. I mean, they just knew and they loved it. Exactly. So I think that's a reason why we kind of got stuck with that description of being like them, because that's the only thing hardcore kids knew at the time. <laughs> so they they didn't know about Dark Tranquility. You know, they didn't know about Night, you know, Nightingales. They didn't know about In Flames, really. Like, they didn't have anything else to compare it to, so... They just went with At The Gates because that's all they knew. Yeah, that was the only band I knew. So if anything was metal, it just sounds like At The Gates. That's it. That's right. And that's why I, that's why it was infuriating for us <laughs> because there was just so much other good music that we we sounded like so many other better bands. And that, that's I'm not saying that to put At The Gates down, but we just sounded like so many other bands that were great. Yeah, and you and it must be especially frustrating because you guys really know metal. Like, you know the bands, you know what you're doing. 
And it's like at the gates is just one band, a small piece of this big thing. Well, that was another infuriating part. You know, it just felt like people were saying that because that's all they knew. And yet we had a million things we could have told them and talked to them about. But they never asked us. <laughs> they just wanted to say, sound like at the gates and then make fun of us for it. And meanwhile, we're like, man, we've been doing this shit for like tw- since I was 12. You know, what are you talking about? So how did you transition from the old death metal band to Darkest Hour? Basically, they they liked playing that style of music. Chris was way into the Swedish style of metal as well. And uh, there were no, I wasn't really, disinterment had, had kind of collapsed. We weren't really doing anything anymore. And I still wanted to play metal. And they were trying to tour. They were trying to play and perform. And that's really all I wanted to do. So I actually got in the band before anybody. Uh, they played a bowling alley with disinterment one time. And my friend Fred... Fred Ziomek, who actually ended up being in Darkest Hour as well, he got me in that band, into Darkest Hour. And, you know, he's a hardcore kid. So was Mike Schleibaum and John Henry. They were just hardcore kids who liked At The Gates. So when I joined, you know, we just kind of pushed the envelope because like, hey, check out all this other cool music that's not At The Gates. <laughs> and, you know, we just started to, to, to grow from there. And then when Fred left, we got Chris in the band. And then my friend Paul Burnett joined on bass. And next thing you know, we were playing what I call Melodic death metal. That's what I thought we were doing. <laughs> so were you never really into the hardcore scene and all that stuff? Uh, I mean, there are some, like I said, there's some, there are some top notch bands from every genre, you know, I, and I definitely saw a lot of hardcore bands play when I was with Darkest Hour. I mean, we play with hardcore bands all the time. And I think that was also another problem. You know, we didn't really have any connections to the metal world or the sweet, like yet, you know, we hadn't met those people yet. So we were playing with Mouthpiece and Hatebreed and Earth Crisis, you know, all that stuff. And eventually, you know, that's where that's why everybody calls at the gates because that's just what we were doing. We were playing with hardcore bands. And uh, but I, I mean, I like I like some Hatebreed stuff. I like some early Hatebreed. I mean, I'm even into some I like, I like I like some Terror. I like some Madball. You know, there's some stuff I like. How did you go over in the early days? Like, what were the shows like? Uh, I think some people were just trying to understand and wait for the breakdown that never came. That's that's what I think. We, we just didn't, we didn't, we didn't give it to them. We didn't give them the big chugga chugga breakdown. So they had to really listen to us and give it a shot. <laughs> I mean, that's just how I perceived it. I could be all wrong. I don't know. I, I was a metalhead living in a hardcore community world. So I, I, just, I was doing my best. No, you're probably right. Cause I got into hardcore around 1998. And back then I wanted the breakdowns. That's it. Yeah. That's all people were waiting for. It's like, Go fast and then give me the big open E, whatever, chug, chug me, chug me to death. And that just, we just never did it. <laughs> well, I, I like that. You know, you're challenging people or not even challenging people, really. You're just doing what you do. Yeah, that's just, that's just how we were rolling at the time. So you're in metal bands, you're in Darkest Hour. How do we form City of Caterpillar? Because that's pretty different from all the metal you're describing. Well, that's why, it's, this is why the story takes a twist because before uh, I was actually, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. I was in a band with Brandon Evans, who plays guitar in City of Caterpillar. And can can you curse on this program? Oh yes. Okay. The band was called Not Sure Fuck. This, whoa, is that for me? I mean, it's, hey, Chris Norris is calling me right now. How odd is that? He's, is it, <laughs> his ears must be burning. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So I was in a band with Brandon called Not Sure Fuck, and we had done some touring, and it was kind of like a city. It was kind of like City of Caterpillar, so it was way more aggressive. We didn't really have super pretty parts. We, we did have them, but not to that extent. And that was all happening at the same time as I was in Darkest Hour, like even the beginnings of it. All that was all happening at the same time. Yeah, we did that. And then when Much Fuck broke up, we started City of Caterpillar immediately after. We got my friend Adam Dresco on bass, and then we got Jeff Kane on guitar. And we did a four song or five song demo. And then, uh, then Adam left the band after the demo. And then we did the full length. And then I left the band after the full, well, I didn't leave the band, but we kind of parted ways after the full length. They went on to keep playing because I was too busy with Darkest Hour because we started touring a lot more. Because of that record that we did in Sweden, we just started to tour a whole lot. And it just kind of went from there. How did you feel about City of Caterpillar? It sounds like it's outside of your normal wheelhouse. And, you know, for the time, even then it was pretty fringe music. I'll call it screamo, like the emotional heavy post hardcore slash hardcore and it's it's having a bit more of a resurgence now i think a lot more people are listening to it but i remember back then like those were pretty fringe bands yeah i don't i don't consider it screamo i don't think i don't don't know that's just me like i guess this is the same conversation we just had about you know 
melodic death metal and and hardcore and you know i, I don't know i i i believed i be, i'm or being called metalcore i didn't think darkest hour was a metalcore band i don't really believe city of caterpillar is a screamo band i mean we were i thought we were punk it was just noisy it was loud it was crazy but we were listening to godspeed you black emperor we were listening to mogwai we were listening to ports to pass i mean which i guess some could consider that screamo or emo or whatever but to me, it just sounded like instrumental, like symphonic, symphonic punk, or I don't, I don't, I can't even explain it. To me, like City of Caterpillar was just a blend of Godspeed and and anything heavy, born against any kind of punk, any kind of noisy, Arab on radar, you know what I mean? Anything like that. It was just kind of chaotic, out of control, like angel hair, that kind of stuff. Honeywell, which I guess people call screamo, which is, I guess, yeah, yeah. but that, I mean. Brandon was way into Angel Hair. Brandon was way into Antioch Arrow, you know. So he did come from that, from that world. And Jeff Kane at the time, he was in Enemy Soil. I mean, he did that band for a little bit. So there's just so much metal in our roots and in our veins, but we just transferred it over to what we like to do. And I don't know. I don't think we ever thought about doing anything specifically genre related. We just were writing what we what was influencing us at the time. Yeah, I like hearing that list of influences too. I mean, you have super heavy stuff like enemy soil you have the screamo stuff like honeywell and then you have some post-rock stuff like godspeed all coming together because it you know it really city of caterpillar it really is a unique sound yeah i agree i mean and at the whole time the whole time i'm listening to napalm death you know, <laughs> you know we're, we're, we're not we're not blast beating or anything but uh you know i'm also not I'm not rim shotting the whole time either you know but and i i, I mean i like christy front drive don't get me wrong i, I i'm i'm into that i there's a lot of bands like that that I can get behind. Does it stand the test of time? I don't know. I haven't played a Christy Front Drive record in a long time, but I love that band. I can tell you that. I, I never disliked it. Oh, yeah, it's good. It's good. So what do you think while you're in this band, while you're playing in this band? Because you're more of the metal world. I mean, are, are you into what's going on? Are you into some of these influences as well? Yeah. I mean, I love Godspeed. I love Mogwai. I love Stars of the Lid. I love stuff with no drums. I get, I, I'm like I said, there's a little bit of everything. I, I love it all. And uh, like I said, death metal is kind of the root. That's kind of where I'm always going to be, but I'm not afraid to, I'm not afraid to jump to another tree and check it out, man. You know, I like a, a lot of people will just, they, they, they want to stay in the bubble and I'm just not like that. No, that makes sense. Yeah. I'm like that now too. I don't want to just do one thing. It just gets boring. And, and as far as musicianship and writing, you can just so easily kind of write the same thing over and over again and i don't want to do that anymore no i don't and i i'm with you i mean i want to expand i like to listen to different music and i like to incorporate different vibes and i, I just i don't feel like they're i mean when you're a musician the point is to play period <laughs> i just want to play drums i want to be challenged i want to try different things i don't want to double bass for the rest of my life i want to double bass but not all the time and not forever i mean not not for just one double bass thing forever i, I want to do it all I, I want to play it all. And if I have an opportunity to play with people who I think are really good who and we have songs that we feel like are strong that we want to share and we can make them, why not? Absolutely. That's the way to go. So you're doing double duty between Darkest Hour and City of Caterpillar, yes? Yes. Those must be a stark contrast in shows playing with uh, with those two different bands, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. The Darkest Hour shows I'm imagining like Darkest Hour and a bunch of hardcore bands and a bunch of hardcore kids like beating each other up. And then the City of Caterpillar shows I'm imagining like a small basement show and Spock haircuts and studded belts. Yeah. What do they call them? The shotgun blast haircut? <laughs> like yeah. Someone took a shotgun to their mouth and blew the back of their head out. Yeah. <laughs> they, were, they were everywhere. The, sh the shirts were too small. The belts were too white. I mean, there's a lot going on in there. But there's a lot of good community, a lot of good people. And I still talk to a lot of people from that era, you know, good communities, good friends. And from both, And that, I guess the overall dynamic was just the way people looked and what they listened to. But as far as community and people helping each other out, that is universal in every scene, if you have to even say scene, but it's just universal. That's what's so beautiful about music. It is really, truly a unifying experience, however it's presented. A hundred percent. Yeah. What you're saying is spot on about uh, the different scenes, even if they're different. And, you know, I wasn't as into it back in the day because I was stuck in uh, metallic hardcore La La Land. But, you know, bands like Page 99 and Honeywell and City of Caterpillar and Joshua Fifer Battle and 
all those bands, which I broadly call Screamo because that's what I heard when I came in. I like it. The music is interesting. I like the looks. I like the aesthetics. I like everything about it. Yeah. I mean, Page 99 was just insane live. And it, it, it just it just was an experience to watch that band play. It just hundreds of people on stage with instruments going bananas. That's what that band was. And and they were great. And they and they they had an energy to them. And I, I don't know. Is that a scream of energy? I don't know. But it definitely was a musical energy that I think influenced and, and really energized people. And I don't know. That's more important. So City of Caterpillar is playing. We've got the self-titled record out, right? Mm-hmm. How are things going with the band? What are, where are you at in life at this point? So I'm not in the band anymore at this point. <laughs> the, oh, you're out already. So we recorded the album and I never got to play any shows for it. I never did. A, I never played any shows for that album. So it was released. Uh, we parted ways. I started doing a ton. I mean, I was touring 10, 11 months out of the year with Darkest Hour. And so they, and then they carried on. And, then, and that's where they got to play. They, they did shows with Envy, Wrangler Brutes, all kinds of cool. Uh, trail, uh, you'll know as well, the Trail of Dead. They, they started to expand and do a lot of cool stuff. And uh, yeah, and I, I, honestly, I never. So when they ended like a year later, I never saw that coming because I really feel like they they were on a they were they were going they, they but they just never I mean I didn't think they had song they had songs written that they never recorded it's just kind of shocking when it came to an end when you left was it on good terms was everybody cool not really I didn't really want to be out but I understood it and it was but you know it's one of those things where it's like damn if you do damn if you don't I I knew they were doing the right thing because I was so busy. And they had opportunities. I mean, they went to Japan. So, and I just, I just couldn't commit to a lot of the stuff that they wanted to do because I was on a different path. And, you know, it, it was a little weird at first, but we're all good now. It didn't, you know, it didn't stick. How long did it take for things to get okay again? Uh, Kevin and I never stopped talking. Uh, Brandon and I were pretty close. I don't know, not long. I'd say a couple of years. I'm glad to hear that because when I was younger, I could really hold a grudge and, you know, a lot of time would go by, but, it, you know, and it's just the situation. You're young. You're pulled in different directions. You know, we were young, man. I mean, we were young. This is like early 20s stuff. So things hit you a lot harder back then. You don't have anything else to really care about. It's like bands, your friends, like you just think of those things as inseparable. So when you're out of the band, you feel like you've lost friendships or you're just bitter for whatever reason. But looking back on it now, you know, in my 40s, it's like, man, it's just a damn band. <laughs> we are so <laughs> much better friends than we are bandmates. And that's just how it has to be. Yeah, that my attitude is like that now, too. It, it, above all else, I want to preserve the friendship. I don't want to... I'm 40 years old. I'm not going to end a friendship over a band. You know, I'm not going to be fucking uh, the Rolling Stones. It's not going to happen. Yeah, no more of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm with <laughs> you. I, I think I wasted a lot of time being bitter. And, you know, that's on me. But at least I can admit it and I can... And I've moved past it. Did you keep up with the band after you were out? Did you still... Did you ever see them or listen to them? I went to a couple of their shows and then... Uh, I also, you know, I saw Kevin more regularly than anybody else. He would still come by and visit. So I always got updated and he would give me Japanese versions of the record on CD and stuff. So he always kept me in the loop. He was good like that. Was it a bummer not to get to play any of the full length songs, though? Yeah, (laughs) I will say (laughs) that's why those reunion shows were so special to me, because I actually felt like I got to support a record that I helped create. So it was kind of it was kind of like a. I just felt like a, a little bit of closure in a way because we never, in, I never anticipated that we were going to play any more after that anyway. So that those ten shows, it was just, it was. And also, I felt like I got, I kind of got the gravy because, you know, the whole time City of Caterpillar uh, wore a band, no one really gave a shit. It wasn't like we were drawing five thousand people or five hundred people or even a hundred people to any of the shows. So I kind of got to live the heyday tour when that reunion came. You know, it's like every show was badass. Every band we got to play was badass. It was just a really, it was a really visceral and amazing, soulful experience. That's amazing. Yeah, th- those were the uh, 2017 reunions. Yeah, yeah. I think it was 18, wasn't it? Maybe I'm wrong on that. Somewhere around there. Yeah, it was like uh, yeah, but yeah, it was that era. Like I got, I think we did 10 shows, and I, I just was in like you know, I was in La La Land, as you said. Every single show, just floating in space, man. It was sick. So uh, the band breaks up in 2003, and we know there's a big resurgence when you come back in 2018. Did you have any indication of 
this thing like fermenting and growing and there being renewed interest in it over the years? So we had heard that people were starting to get into it and that it had become like that record had somehow made a dent in in the world of the people that knew about it anyway. And it was, I, I don't know, it just started to, to be circulated more and talked about more. And I guess people started to like it more or understand it. I, I don't know. I don't know what happened. But uh, when we decided to do the shows, you know, we figured we'd do one. The plan was to do one in Richmond just to have a good time. And and I felt great. I was like, yes, finally, I get to play these songs live. This will be fun. It'll be a great crowd. It'll be fun. But it just it just snowballed into just show after show, offer after offer, people reaching out, really wanting us to come out. The excitement was there. Shows were selling out in minutes. I mean, the Black Cat in D.C. sold out in like two minutes or something. Just weird stuff, stuff that we did not see coming. And it, it was invigorating. I mean, it made us feel like that all that time that nothing had happened. And then the time that we had spent making that record, maybe it was all worth it. <laughs> I don't know. It was it was flattering. It was humbling. It was uh, still unbelievable to me that that. That's how that went down. That's pretty amazing. So you guys aren't even fully aware of what's going on until the first show is announced and this thing starts snowballing. Yeah, it was just an idea. We, everybody was kind of back in the headspace to do to do it, to play. We had talked about it. We were all feeling good. And yeah, we put together one show. And the next thing we knew, we had 10 shows. We had a tour. <laughs> like, well, we need a vehicle. <laughs> so, you know, like I say, just, we, were, we weren't ready for it. How did it feel to be together with everybody again? performing after all that time awesome it felt awesome there was never a never any problems never a dull moment a lot of laughs a lot of a lot of positive energy everybody was good it was like i said i don't know it was very soulful we just kind of felt like we were buttoning up a, a, a part of our past by doing something in the present and it, it felt really good i love that that sounds awesome so you play these reunion shows you're recording some new music right no no, no, we did the shows and then we went, we went back to our lives. Like another year went by before we actually started to talk about even doing a new record. That was never the, that was never the plan. The plan was never to do another record. We never talked about it on tour. We never even joked about it. That never came up. So just the shows were the plan and that was it. That's it. So how did you guys come together and start talking about new, new music? How does that happen? So after about a year, uh, Jeff reached out to Brandon and said he had some ideas they started to they started to kind of put some stuff together. This is like 2019, and then uh, the pandemic. Then I think Jeff moved back to Richmond at the end of 2019. So him and I were talking about it. He was showing me the ideas that him and Brandon were working on. I was kind of into what they were doing, and uh, so we got together a couple times. Then the pandemic hit. Brandon's in New York, so he's just kind of stuck. He's just there, and uh, so he didn't come down for a year. But Jeff was and him were still trading ideas. And uh, so we were still working on stuff. And then after the pandemic year, Brandon moved to Richmond. He came back and we just started to really dig in and start writing. That's kind of how that went down. Nice. So it, did, did you envision a full length or did it, did it just happen like that? I think we just wanted to see what we, how many songs we could even do. We didn't put a deadline on anything. And it got yeah. to be where we had 10 pretty solid ideas. And they had come in, they had come together pretty quickly, pretty, I mean, not, I wouldn't say quickly, but they easily, I'd say, because the ideas were flowing, everybody had great ideas. And then eventually we found ourselves with 10 really solid tracks. And then we wheeled it down to, I think, eight is on the record. So yeah, we kept eight, eight of them. So you have these eight songs. Do you demo them and start sending them around to see if anyone's interested or what, what happens? No, we just recorded it. <laughs> ah. Uh Jeff Jeff is a really good engineer, really really solid with the with the mics. He, he he can do some amazing work. So our demos really sounded like the record in my mind. We I I felt like we were making the record while we were technically demoing the record. It felt like we were making it. So after we demoed everything pretty damn well, we decided to go into a studio and kind of record it for real. <laughs> but that's when we started to maybe ask around to see who'd be into it. And uh, of course, the record's coming out on Relapse Records. It comes out September 30th. That's got to be awesome, right? Fantastic label. Yeah, unbelievable. Kind of a shot in the dark. We were really, really happy that that, that landed the way it did. We, uh, we weren't sure who would be interested. And in, I didn't think for a second Relapse would. So when I sent it to them, it was like a shot in the dark, you know, just, just, just giving it a shot to see. But uh, and I, it worked in our favor because there were some guys there who knew us from the past 
who were really hyping the band back then too. So they were really excited about it. We couldn't be happier to be working with them. They're, they've been nothing but awesome so far. That's great. Yeah. And you've got this run of gigs coming up too. And uh, to our listeners, those shows kick off September 29th. The first one is September 29th at the Black Cat in DC. We've got a string of dates. A couple are sold out. But uh, I mean, it must be pretty incredible, right? Because uh, you're out uh, around the time the full length comes out. You don't get to play these shows. But now we're playing together again, writing together again. And we've got a string of tour dates. Yeah, it feels... It's pretty surreal. <laughs> uh, not, not, you know, not to mention this has been like a three-year process just from beginning to, to this day right now. We have just been waiting for this record to come out. It, it has been, it's been a grueling, <laughs> grueling year this year because we, it's been done, you know, since January, February of this year. But, you know, it takes so long for things to happen. So having these shows booked, having people excited I'm proud of the record. I know my bandmates are too. Everybody's very proud of the record. We feel really strong about it. We feel good about it. No, uh, no apologies there. So, you know, you get, hopefully people dig it. We'll just have to see. I mean, they have to, they just have to have you, everybody, have you heard the new single? I mean, come on, if you don't like that, something is wrong. (laughs) Well, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, we're really happy with it and I, I can only hope that people get it. I mean, you know, we were laughing the other day because maybe it'll be a record that doesn't, Catch on for another 10, 20 years. Who knows? <laughs> be hilarious. Can you imagine if that happened again? No, because I'll be in my 60s. I don't, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to, you know, sleep the night without peeing 1,500 times. So I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully people will appreciate it and understand what it is. Like, I, we always just say, you know, there's no, there's no point. It's not about us. It's about the music. It's not about who's in the band. It's about the music. You know, there, you shouldn't slap a genre on it. You shouldn't categorize it. You shouldn't label it. You shouldn't try to because of relapse. You shouldn't try to put any judgment on it whatsoever. Just listen to it for what it is. And to us, it's just an album that we're really happy with, that we feel like really brings out a side of our writing that we never really got to do before. And just another expansion of who we are as a band and and what we do musically. And I don't know. We're proud of it. I love that. And I agree agree 100% with what you're saying. You know, I'm 40 years old now, as I've mentioned earlier in the conversation. I don't have so many preconceived notions about music and genres and labels and scenes and all this bullshit. Something comes across my desk. I just listen to it. And that happened with you guys. You know, I didn't hear the band back in the day because I was only listening to like metallic hardcore and that kind of stuff. But uh, I love the band. I love what I hear. I'm excited for the record. And I'm actually starting a band that kind of sounds more like what you guys are doing and the so-called screamo bands are doing. So I'm, I'm getting much more uh, into this world and I love it. That's awesome. You know what I like about everything you just said is that you didn't had, you, you know, there was no preconception. The, the record came on your desk and you listened to it. That's all I can ask anyone to do. <laughs> you know, if someone hands it to you, don't start trying to figure out what it is. Just put it on and listen to the damn thing. Cause I mean, I, I I've said this a million times, but I think it's one of the most genius quotes of all time. Uh, One of my friends, Tom Smith, has always said, genre is obsolete. And I couldn't agree with him more because it really is about the music. I mean, that's what musicians get into this whole thing for. I mean, you know, you're not trying to you're not trying to sell yourself. You're trying to sell what you not even sell. You're just trying to share music with people. And it's it, it does. It does get frustrating when people see the relapse label and they're like, this is not metal. It's like, who gives a fuck? This is music. I mean, and it, it's it's. It's dark. It's dirty. There's an underbelly to this whole scene, I feel like, and we've tapped into it, <laughs> you know, because it, it's a it's still it's still brutal, in my opinion. It is. It is. If you I mean, if you listen to the band, it's certainly got an edge. And do people still do that? Will they will they see the relapse label and and actually be upset that something isn't metal? Yeah, I think we saw one comment where someone had said uh, on like someone said relapse used to put out good music. Now they put out garbage. And I, I, I that couldn't be further from the truth. But that's just a preconception that Relapse puts out just metal. And the thing is, who's to say City of Caterpillar isn't metal? Who's to say that? No one, because the influence is there. It's all over the place. If you listen to that record, you will hear the metal in it. It's impossible not to. And you can hear the you can hear the pretty, and you can hear the sickness. It's it's all there. That's what I love about the band. It's just a it's just a it's a blend of of everything that we come from, everything that we love, and everything that we've listened to. I, there's no other way to explain it. That's why I relapsed was like, hell yeah, we want to do this because they hear that too. They hear that too. 
Yeah, and you know, I'm I'm actually less likely to listen to a label these days if they're only doing one thing. I like that relapses mixing it up a lot more these days. Yeah, I mean, you have to. It just you can't keep putting out the same thing over and over again. It's like you can't keep making the same record over and over again, unless you're Motorhead, which is badass. Of course, they can do that, but you know, some certain bands do certain things and and they're good at it. And I, and I. That's not to say that you shouldn't stick to what you know, but at the same time, it's nice to get out of your comfort zone and experiment a little bit and see what happens. I mean, that's life. That makes it spicy. I'm with you on that. What was the quote? Genre is obsolete. Genre is obsolete. And the guy who said that his name is Tom Smith, he passed away uh, this year. But he and if anyone can say that it's him, he comes from a even darker, crazier world of music that is anti-music. So <laughs> uh, if you ever get a chance to check out, he he's notorious for his project or his band, I'd say, or he, it's more of a collective called To Live and Shave in L.A. And it's a it's a dark ride. I like the sound of that. <laughs> I mean, it really is anti-music. I mean, if you t- you talking about opening your mind, you better open that motherfucker as wide as you can. Well, I'm going to check that out for sure. But yeah, I like uh, I like that quote. I feel like there's a lot of interesting music going on right now that can't be tied necessarily to one genre. And maybe it's just because I'm older and more out of touch, but I feel like there's less gatekeeping. You know, it's like, oh, it has to be this or you have to do that. I feel like everybody's just playing the music they want to play. And there's a lot of music that's really good. It's just there's awesome stuff happening. That's called freedom. <laughs> that is true <laughs> musical freedom the ability to do what you want without having to cater to people who demand something different you can just do whatever the fuck you want play how you want and hopefully people will appreciate it and if they do awesome if they don't that's cool too no hard feelings but there's no reason to walk around stomping your feet if something's on relapse it doesn't sound like it should be on relapse that's just ridiculous what a waste of time i'm with you on that i think even back in the day like there was like a little controversy for relapse signing Dillinger Escape Plan, you know? How silly is that? Which is funny because they're like insanely heavy. Yeah, they're, they're, they're heavy as shit. I can honestly tell you. I mean, I had the opportunity to tour with them a few times and they were never bad. Never. Not only were they completely talented beyond human recognition, but they were heavy. They were creative. They were insane. And they cannot be categorized. They don't sound like anything. There's nothing like them on the planet. Nothing. Yeah, that must be cool. Like, they're truly one of a kind. And it must be, it must really be something to be in a band like that. Yeah, I mean, it's freedom. (laughs) That's what it is. They can write whatever they want and slap Dillinger Escape Plan on it, and it will sound like them. And they can do it forever if they wanted to. I mean, I know they're not around anymore, but every record evolved. Every record had its own vibe, its own feeling. And they weren't afraid to do it. And that's also, I don't know, courage. Kudos to them, man. So we know that City of Caterpillar got started back up around 2018, but you know there's a lot of time from the time you left the band leading up to that reunion. We know you were in Darkest Hour up till 2011, yes? Yep. What happened? Did you leave? Uh, Darkest Hour? Yes. Kind of the same deal, just kind of parting ways, didn't, didn't go well. There was just, at that time, there was just a lot of stress, a lot of life stuff. Uh, Paul Burnett, who's probably one of my closest pals uh bass player he had left a few months prior so there was just it was on the downward trend it was just for for me personally i it was like uh you know you stick with something because you think you should and i think i just was like beating a dead horse i just kind of wasn't into where we were heading musically and i'm I'm loyal you know i'll I'll, I'll stick it through but i I think i just stayed too long i probably should have left before so i think a lot of emotions were running running rampant a lot of things were said that probably shouldn't have been and a lot of things I regret, but one of those things where, you know, time always kind of, kind of heals, you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, we all, we all still talk. It's all still cool. Everything's good. But yeah, that just kind of, that just kind of ended and they, they still roll, you know, they're, they're still going. So, so what did you do after that? I mean, uh, did, you must've felt kind of lost because you're, you're touring in this band for a long time. I mean, right after that, I got on the phone with one of my closest friends, Tony Foresta, and we started Iron Reagan. <laughs> oh, the well, there you go. Day. Yeah. And then I just did what did that band for about eight years, touring like crazy, being maniacs, playing thrash, like one of my all time. Also, you know, Exodus, Metallica, that's my old one of my loves from my past as well. And I got to do it with a bunch of close friends from that. I mean, you know, I don't know. I, like I said, I've been very fortunate living where I have with 
and being around the musicians that I have been because it's it's all been solid. So I did that for a long time. And on that on that journey, I met Chris Olsh and we did Mammoth Grinder for a while. I was also on Relapse. Oh, yeah. Death metal band. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. No double bass, just caveman style death metal. Love that shit, too. So it was kind of a yeah, that was a wild ride. Good times. So you you've never it sounds like you've never stopped playing. You're just in it. I've never sat still. I'm not I'm not able to. And, this, and, I, and yeah, just not able to. And right now, I've got City of Caterpillar going, and uh, I'm also doing a band with the Taylor Brothers from Page I Nine called Terminal Bliss. We did a ten song EP on Relapse as well. If you haven't heard that, check it out. I have to check. You know what? Uh, I have a lot of homework to do, and I can't wait to listen to all this stuff. <laughs> hey, I'll send you some links to some cool shit if you want anything. And you let me know what you want. I'll try to get you on board. Yes, please do. I'll I'll send you my email after this. So, please do. okay. So let's talk about what we've got coming up. Now we have we have the new City of Caterpillar record, Mystic Sisters, that comes out September 30th on Relapse Records, right? Yep. We're very excited for everybody to hear that, right? Oh yeah, please, please check it out. Yeah, I think it might be out by the time this comes out. I don't have the schedule right in front of me, but listen, check it out. And if it's not out, there's two singles out there, Mystic Sisters, and decider and you know what it wasn't quite what i was expecting and i love that like mystic sisters there's like this really nice build up uh and then exploding into city of caterpillar really like the band really excited to hear the whole record thanks man yeah i think also by the time this drops too uh there'll be another single coming out here pretty soon so uh that that'll be out there too by the time i think this comes out yeah so listen we have to hear it we have to pick up physical records right that helps you guys out yeah, that would be awesome. And also, Brandon Evans did an amazing job with the artwork. It looks freaking great. Uh, I don't know. He he really put his heart into this one, so uh, we're really excited about it. It looks fantastic. I can't wait. I haven't even I haven't even seen or held this thing yet. So when it comes to my house, I'm, I can't wait to roll around with it. It's going to be great. <laughs> you said it's been recorded since January or February of this year. Yeah, it was finished early early 2022. Yep. It's got to be hard to sit on it for that long, right? Oh man, it's been grueling. It has been grueling. We just like sit around going, well, another month, huh? Here we go. <laughs> but now we're talking two weeks. We're talking two weeks now, man. So we're on the verge. Are you on like the major press cycle? Like, you know, I, I saw your name everywhere a couple months ago. Reunion shows, album. It was all over the place. Uh, th- Yeah, we're all kind of picking up and doing what we can. Everyone's everyone's putting in the time, doing some interviews, doing the best we can to get it out there, get the word out. I mean, talking to people we've never talked to before. People interested that have never been interested before. It's been really cool. It's been really nice. It's oh. it's it's humbling. It's humbling, honestly, to just be able to you know talk about a band that has that has not done anything in twenty years and a record that you know no one's even heard yet, and yet people are asking questions about it. It, it truly is humbling. It just it puts you back flat footed on earth, you know. Yeah, that's one of my favorite stories. I talk to a lot of musicians, but when this time capsule thing happens, where like. When it's out initially, people don't really get it. And then a decade or two decades goes by and then there's this explosion. I I just love that. Yeah. I mean, like, unexpected, very unexpected twist. Very delighted by that unexpected twist, though, I got to say. I just, uh, you know, we'll see how this one goes. I hope it doesn't take 10 years to catch, but we'll have to see. No, you're you're here now. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're coming out swinging. So don't. Yeah, that's, that's true. We got dates. We're coming. Coming your way. Yeah, you've got this uh, string of uh, live dates coming up, right? That's got to be exciting. Oh, yeah, very. We're looking forward to it. We've been practicing. We're getting our show ready, so it should be, should be cool. And have we talked about plans for the future? Like, uh, n- I know it's early, but new music, more shows, like any kind of discussions like that? Uh, we definitely have a lot more shows coming up. And we have a couple ideas that are kind of we're, we're kind of bouncing around. But for us, we... I, I think to write an album to, or even an EP or just write a song period, we just need to be completely focused on that, on that particular thing. I mean, not that we can't multitask, but I think for us, we, we benefit better and the music benefits better if we're just focused on writing instead of like performing or playing shows, you know? So I think once we do some shows and get that out of our system and, and, and get that energy, we'll just take it back into the back space and try to see if we can write some new stuff. We always want to write. That's, that's something that we always talk about doing. We always want to create. It's just finding the time and finding the focus to do it. Exactly. It gets a lot harder when we're older now. We've got dogs. We've got chickens. I mean, yeah. forget about it. It's crazy. Dogs, chickens, a killer cat. It's it's a wild ride right now. 
<laughs> what kind of animals does your cat kill and bring back? Uh, these little things called voles. You ever heard of these things? Oh, aren't they like little rodent things? Yeah. So she brings those back to us all the time. And Kim's had to run around and chase Eddie with a bird in her mouth a few times, which is pretty gru- like gruesome. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's just out of love. She does it all out of love. And she's named after the amazing, you know, after Killer Eddie from, from Iron Maiden. So it all makes sense. She's just not carrying an axe. She just got axe in her mouth, you know, with her teeth. <laughs> is City of Caterpillar going to be the focus now, or do you have other bands that uh, you're busy with? Uh, actually, right after this, I got band practice with a band I'm doing called Spore, <laughs> which is just sick, fast punk. Uh, still doing Terminal Bliss. We're, we're, getting, we're actually getting ready to write a full length that'll be out hopefully next year. We're going to get started with that. Uh, City of Caterpillar, though, mostly is the focus. I've, I do a couple other bands. I got a band I'm in called Bleach Everything. Oh, yeah. That's with uh, Brent from uh, Dark Operative. Yeah, Brent and uh, Graham Scala and uh, Kelly Posados, who was also in Jesuit, another scream. Yes. Yeah. So that band's a lot of fun. We haven't done anything in a little while, but, uh, and also those same four people, we do a project called Harmonic Cross, which is uh, kind of uh, like ambient. No drums really involved, just kind of ambient, uh, spatial type type stuff we did a record a couple years ago and we actually just finished up a new one that will be out soon and uh i don't know just constantly trying to create music as much as humanly possible i'd say and also i'm in a band called suppression two-piece i've been in that band for almost 20 years that band's been going the entire time all these other shit's been happening (laughs) so i just got back from chicago with them this week with him this weekend we played la the weekend before that uh that stuff's just maniacal grind to the to the max a lot of fun to do two piece bass and drums and uh we're actually we just finished a collaboration with uh bastard noise who uh eric wood also used to be in man is a bastard and we just finished that up and then we're getting ready to write a full length so busy busy man feeling it i'm happy that i asked you because it, it the just the amount of music that you're creating is unbelievable and awesome thanks man yeah i i, I don't know i like to I like to play drums as much as humanly possible uh, I, and I'll, yeah, when you send me your email, I'll send you this other thing. I did a, um, a collaboration record with a bunch of crazy musicians from Richmond. That's called Slow Burning Rage. That came out last December, and it's just eight songs, and uh, every song is very, very different. It's a, a definitely a genre roller coaster, but uh, you know, some of it's wild, some of it's nice and nice and, uh, and ethereal. Some songs have drums, some songs don't. But that was a lot of fun to make too. I don't know if I'll ever do another one, but. It was a lot of fun to, I just had all these ideas that I've been sitting on for years and I just wanted to get them out. So that was a lot of fun to do too. That's on Bandcamp. I mean, you, you must just be at band practice or on tour or writing. You just must be busy all the time. Yeah, it's been good. I've got, I've got a good family unit who supports everything I do. So if I didn't have that, there's no way I could even do it. Yeah. I mean, that's key. That's key. That is, that is the only key. That is, (laughs) that's the key to life. That's the key to freedom, man. If you've got, if you've got love and support, you can do whatever the hell you need to do to make yourself happy. It's it's really cool. Well, Ryan, I'm looking forward to more from City of Caterpillar and, of course, the many other bands that you're working on. I'm looking forward to hearing more. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. It was great talking to you, and uh, thanks for the time. Yeah, Keith, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and talk to me, man. I really appreciate it. And the fact that you care and you listened and, and you enjoy music the way that I think people should – that's it's it's wonderful to talk to other like, like-minded folks who love music who just understand music and that's what i'm saying man the community keeps growing now you and i are connected you know what i mean you give me that email address we'll start changing you know sending each other music it's a great thing it's how it should work there you go done how would you feel about starting a 19th band with me what do you play guitar send me some riffs there we go done deal <laughs> yeah man we're on a <laughs> roll and just like that And there you have it, Ryan Parrish. Wow. Really nice guy. Super nice. Great conversation. I wasn't even aware of how many bands he was in before I spoke to him. And he's just done so much. He's just done so much. I mean, look at the body of work. Incredible musician. Super nice guy. I'm a newer fan of City of Caterpillar. Uh, My bandmates turned me on to them. And I dig it. They're turning me on to a lot of good music. And City of Caterpillar is one of those bands. And I'm happy that they're back. 
like Ryan was saying, he's got a second chance now. They can get out there and play. There's new appreciation for them. And I'm looking forward to more. Thank you, Ryan, for coming on the show. That was fantastic. So let's check in, huh? How are we doing? I'm doing great. As you're listening to this right now, I am on my way back from Furnace Fest, and I'm sure I had a great time. You'll find out in next week's show if I did. I might do a Furnace Fest recap show. I might not. I don't know. I got to see how things are going. I got to see what's going on. But either way, you're going to hear about the fest from me, and I'm sure I had a great time. Otherwise, things are going great for the most part. You heard in the beginning of the show, we hit our Apple Podcast and Spotify review goal. Show is going great. This is my favorite time of year. The weather is cooling down. Fall in New York City is the best. I wouldn't trade it for anything. This is it. And I've got a new uh, the Holy Fawn Dimensional Bleed. That's my official album of the fall. I was walking around in Manhattan yesterday listening to it, and I got the feels, man. I got the feels. Great record. Great record. So again, make sure you check it out. And, you know, I went through something recently. I have a friend who ended up in the hospital the other week. I didn't know what it was for at the time. But what I do know is that this friend has not lived the healthiest lifestyle. He drinks all day, every day, smokes cigarettes all day, every day. I thought maybe that was a contributing factor. And this is something I've been sitting on for a long time. And I don't know what to say or do about it because I've seen this person change and not for the better. It makes me uncomfortable to be around them. They're different now from what I remember. And I hear he's in the hospital. So right away, my mind goes to liver failure, cancer, this and that. And it turns out it wasn't any of that. You know, it was something unrelated. But there's all these feelings boiling under the surface for me. And I don't know what to do about it. I don't feel like I can have an honest conversation with him because I don't feel like it will go well. I don't feel like it will be received well. There's that piece of it. And also taking into account that that used to be my life. I used to live an incredibly unhealthy lifestyle, probably more unhealthy than this person. And there's that angle to it as well. You know, maybe it'll sound contradictory coming from me to say, hey, this is how you should live your life when you take into account how I used to live my life. So I walked into the situation tense with all of these unresolved feelings. You know, I visited him in the hospital and I kind of tried to have some conversations and they didn't go so well. And my friend is in denial about the state of his health. And I know what's going to happen. I know that he's going to get out and some amount of time is going to go by and that he's just going to go back to the way things were. And I think I have to accept that. You know, I don't have any control over the situation. I guess I could say something. Maybe it would help. Maybe it wouldn't. But again, you know, I was in that situation and nobody was going to make me stop until I was ready to stop. I had to make the decision. And maybe he doesn't want to stop. That's his right. That's his choice. You know, if he told me, hey, this is my life and this is how I want to live it. And that's it. I would have to accept that and move on. But, you know, I was visiting him in the hospital and there was people there and everybody's just kind of making jokes and making light of the situation. And that upset me because I was taking it seriously. So I left not on the best terms. And I think everything's okay now. You know, I've since talked to everybody and everything is good, but it's an ongoing situation for me, at least. I have a lot of feelings to process and I don't exactly know how to process them. So Otherwise, there's not much going on. It's business as usual here at New Scene Inc. So that's it. That's it for this episode. You can reach me at New Scene Pod at iodinerecords.com and on any of our social media. I check it regularly. I'm back next week with a new episode and a new guest. We've got a lot of good stuff coming up. So continue to check in. Thanks everybody for listening. And until next time. <laughs>